This video will explain planning and learning with tabular methods. Chapter 8 in an Introduction to Reinforcement Learning by Richard Sutton and Andrew Bartow. This video is a part of a series going through this book, chapter by chapter, explaining some of the key concepts and ideas. So if you're new to the series, please check out chapter 1 linked in the description. A free PDF of this book is linked in the description, as well as a print version if you're interested in buying it. The key concept of chapter 8 is to understand the difference between planning and learning. This is the key idea between model-based and model-free reinforcement learning. So in chapters 3 and 4, we saw the uh, dynamic programming algorithms using a Markov decision process where we have a model of the environment, meaning that we know the transition probabilities of the next state and reward given the current state action pairs. And this is in contrast to model-free learning that learns solely through trial and error learning, like Monte Carlo learning or the temporal difference learning algorithms. So in this chapter, we're going to look at unifying planning by using the model to simulate experience and updating our value function and then thus our policy in this way, compared to direct reinforcement learning or you know learning where we get the experience directly and then update our value function or and our policy directly from this experience. Then we're going to look at things like prioritized sweeping, trajectory sampling, and then we'll look at decision time planning. We'll get into the Monte Carlo tree search algorithm, which is a key fuel behind AlphaGo, although we won't fully get into the AlphaGo uh, algorithm until our coverage of chapter 16. This diagram shows how planning and learning can be related to each other and are essentially the same thing just based on whether we're deriving our experience from the actual environment or from a model of our environment where we can simulate experience. So we have our value in our policy, our value function being the estimate of the values of states or state action pairs, and then our policy is made to be greedy with respect to the value or the Q function, and then we act in the environment and we receive experience. So in model-based learning, we use this experience to update our model, and then we use the model to simulate new experiences and then use planning, which is the same exact learning algorithm that we've been setting, things like one-step uh, temporal difference learning, Q learning, SARSA, all these kind of things can be done with the simulated experience from the model, compared to where we just do trial and error learning, and we just directly learn from the experience compared to constructing this model. The pseudocode for this algorithm will show the random sample one-step tabular Q planning algorithm. So in this case, we're looking at a random sample model of our environment. So it's a model-based reinforcement learning agent, and then we're going to use the one-step where we just do uh, you know one step into the future to do our temporal difference update, and then we're going to use the Q planning al Q learning algorithm where we're going to use this off policy, taking the uh, max action with respect to the Q function at our update state. So what we're going to do is we're going to select the state in the action, and then we're going to send this to the, a sample model to obtain the next state and next reward. So contrastingly to model free learning, where we would select our state action and we're sort of interacting in the environment, here we're sending this to our sample model, and then we're getting a sample uh, reward in next state from our model rather than the actual environment. And then it's the same as our usual Q learning algorithm where we're applying our update by taking the reward at the next time step plus the discount factor times this is the off policy Q learning uh, decision making to take uh, to uh, value the next state S prime that we end up in. And then we subtract this by our original estimate of the value of that uh, original state action pair that we started with. Now that we have an idea of how planning and learning can be similar and how they are used differently in the model-based, model-free context, now we look at this diagram and start taking apart more of the details behind model-based learning. So particularly we look at this thing of search control and then planning our update. So basically the idea is if you imagine playing chess, you don't need to have some kind of optimal value function and policy for all possible configurations of chess pieces on a chessboard because it's just unlikely that most of these states are actually going to appear in a given game. So this is kind of the idea behind prior prioritized sweeping and trajectory sampling is to sort of control how we plan our updates. First we'll look at how the number of planning steps that we take after each real experience can impact how quickly we can learn. So this graph shows the number of planning steps as a function of n equals zero planning steps where you're just directly learning from the experience only and doing no planning, meaning you're not doing any queries of your model to simulate new experience and update your value functions and thus your policy in that way. You're only doing it through direct experience compared to having five planning steps between real, real experience and then having 50 planning steps between real experience. So this is the toy problem where you start here and the goal state is here. You receive a reward of say minus one everywhere until you re reach the goal or zero everywhere until you reach the goal of plus one. So without planning, the agent is only able to update its value function on the state right before the goal state. However, when it simulates the model several times, it's able to update way more of the trajectory in the, you know, in the state space with the uh, n equals 50 planning steps. A particularly interesting characteristic of model-based reinforcement learning is that sometimes the model of the environment might be incorrect. Now this is a case uh, shown here where the environment is changing over time. So initially this is our maze and the agent takes this path to get to the goal, but then the environment randomly changes and blocks off this path and opens up this path. 
So the model of the environment still might think that this is the environment and then the uh, you know probability of S prime given SA and taking this action up is gonna be, you know, you're here now. Rather than all of a sudden the environment says you can no longer make this up decision and you know transition into this next state. So this is especially challenging when the opened up or the new environment is actually uh, better than the previous one. Because in this case, it goes here and then it quickly learns that it can't go here anymore and then it will learn to take this route. But in this case, it will initially take this route and then even as this opens up, it won't really have much of a signal to know to uh, you know, explore this route opposed to just taking this route. So the way that they improve this is by using the DynaQ agent. If you see these two graphs, you see the DynaQ plus is ahead of the uh, DynaQ in both cases. And what this does is similar to the upper confidence bound studied in chapter two. It adds a reward to states that haven't been experienced in the real world and the real experience rather than the model simulation for a while. So it's similar to UCB with the epsilon greedy selection except for in UCB, you're changing the epsilon probability of selecting the random actions based on you know, when you last uh, tried them. In model-based reinforcement learning, we can tr choose to have either a distributional model or a sample model. A sample model would just produce a, you know, a given next state, given a current state action pair, whereas a distributional model would give you the probability of all next, uh, you know, S prime next state reward pairs given the current state action pair. So the key thing to note between expected and sample updates is that expected updates are more computationally expensive, especially as a function of the branching factor of state action next state pairs. So in this case, you have a branching factor of three. From this state action pair, you can either go, or, or, or two for each of these uh, state action, uh, you know, and then leaf notes. So you have two is the branching factor here. But you'd imagine if this goes to like 10, it would be way more computationally intensive to do an expected update compared to just a one step uh, sample update. So the math behind expected versus sample updates, in an expected update, you're summing over the probability of the next state reward pair given the current state action pair, and then you're doing the uh, you know calculation of the reward plus the discount factor times the Q learning update where you're taking the value of the S prime uh, action that you've transitioned into compared to sample updates where you're just making one uh, step and you don't need to sum over all the possible uh, next states and rewards uh, weighted by the probabilities of occurring characteristic of efficient reinforcement learning algorithms is the way in which they structure their updates. So you can imagine in many problems, like previously we discussed in chess, how there's many configurations of the pieces that will never really occur in a chess game. And in many problems, they share this kind of characteristic. So the idea of prioritized sweeping is you're only going to update states that have had a significant change in their value function at the last iteration. And you might keep like a queue to uh, store the values of states or store the states that have just had a uh, big change in their policy, I mean in their value, and then you would keep the uh, predecessor uh, states to that state as well in the queue so that you can go and update the predecessors to states that have had massive changes because they're more likely to uh, you know, be changed as well. So this is also a good example in this racetrack example where you have to drive a car around a track. And in this case, dynamic programming where you exhaustively sweep over the entire state space takes twice as long as real-time dynamic programming where you're only sampling trajectories on the policy you know, that are much more likely to actually occur in the, uh, you know, in the task. Now we'll look at the idea of decision time planning. Previously, these algorithms have been known as background planning, where we're using our planning to simulate experience from the model and then use this to update our value function and thus our policy. Contrastingly, decision time planning is where we're going to do our planning or simulate our experience and only use this for the current time step, not to update our value functions or policies. So one example of this is heuristic search where say you're at this current uh, root node where you're looking for a decision, an action to take. So you would just sample these actions and then compute this tree. And then when you find a leaf note with the highest value, you would backpropagate this up and then take that decision. Monte Carlo tree search, the, I, one of the ideas that power AlphaGo, the original algorithm in 2015, 16, has this idea of rather than just pruning away the, uh, you know, the tree that you construct at a real time decision planning agent, you would store the uh, intermediate uh, you know, tree, and then when you make this decision, say from here to here, you would keep the tree that you have already computed and use this to save you more computation in the future. So these decision time planning algorithms are really, uh, it's critical depending on how quickly you have to make a decision. So if you're in a game like chess, where you, let's say the, you get to have five minutes before you make your next move, then you can really use something like a Monte Carlo tree search and make this exhaustive tree. But if you're doing something like a control algorithm, like uh, cart pole balancing or bipedal walker, you probably wouldn't be able to do something like this in order to compute the, uh, you know, the actions the robot needs to take to balance the pole or you know, balance the robot upright in bipedal walking. Thanks for watching this explanation of planning and learning, chapter eight in an introduction to reinforcement learning by Richard Sutton and Andrew Bartow. 
Hopefully from this explanation, you took away the idea of planning and what is meant by planning and reinforcement learning and the differences between background planning where you're using the model to update the value functions and the policy and then the idea between decision time planning where you're just using planning and simulating experience from the model in order to make an immediate decision. Please stay tuned as we go through chapters 9 through 17 and please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and AI videos.